Welcome to Under the Hood of Developer Marketing, the podcast devoted to developer marketing, relations, evangelism, and advocacy. I'm Stathis Jorakopoulos, and I'm your host. In each episode, I welcome a guest from the developer marketing world. We talk about best practices, challenges, lessons learned, and share insights, data, and experiences to help you boost your devrel game, talk to, and engage with developers. This podcast is brought to you by Slash Data, the leading analyst of the developer economy, and devrelx.com, a hub devoted to providing resources for developer marketing professionals, including developer ecosystem trends, news and job openings, webinars, a book, and a bi-weekly digest you can subscribe to. Access them all at devrelx.com. Let's see what's under the hood of today's guest. And I'll say on our, it's about hearts and minds. Right? How do you reach someone's mind? We're explaining, hey, this works, and have that intellectual curiosity and honest conversation about a product. Right? Everyone who builds products has bugs in it, but helping and understanding those products and understanding the customers is essential. Welcome to season three of Under the Hood of Developer Marketing. I'm Stati Jurgakopoulos, your host. For our first episode of this season, we wanted to invite someone special, and so we did. I'm very happy to introduce to you Jeff Sandquist, who is a Corporate Vice President of Microsoft and the godfather of this podcast. Jeff, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Godfather of the podcast. Wow, well, that's an honor. Thanks for having <laughs> me over. Yeah, we did a blog post together a couple of years back titled Under the Hood of Developer Marketing, uh, which, uh, long story short, was the driver that led let us where we are today. So Jeff, will you please introduce yourself to our listeners? I'm Jeff Sandquist. I'm a corporate vice president at Microsoft. Uh, my team gets up every day um, really trying to help developers and just help developers succeed. So I lead developer relations at Microsoft. And uh, how did you end up in your current role? Was there <laughs> a driving force, uh, a role model maybe? Oh my gosh. You know, if I'd say, how do I end up in this role? You know, really... I started at Microsoft back in around 97 answering the phone. I was, I did developer support. And when you called the 1-800 number, whether it was set up for Visual Basic or how to code or, you know, loop through a record set in ADO or in active server pages back in the time, I was the person that you got the call. And so, you know, that's how I started in the company. I've worked on product, a lot of different roles, but the consistent part of it for me, it's been about helping developers. And, you know, for me working at Microsoft, and it really was the perfect place because as a company, our founding moment was Bill and Paul. Um, you know, they built a tool for developers, basic for the Altair. The very first thing that they did after they finished, they didn't do a sales call. Heck, they went to a meetup. Uh, they went to the Homebrew Computing Club to show everybody what they built. And that's kind of what we do for a living in developer relations. We build something cool and we get out and share the, it around the world. And, um, you know, that's really what I do and how I got started was answering the phone. Do you want to walk us through the journey from answering the phone uh, <laughs> sure. all the way to today? Yeah, you know, um, I can walk you through it. You know, first to kind of even go back where I'm originally from, you know, really my origin where I grew up is a small farming community in Southern Saskatchewan, a little town called Estevan, Saskatchewan. Um, we lived in outside of that town, just a little, little rural community in around Estevan where I went to school. And uh, the little town I grew up in was had about 100 people. Um, I say Estevan, like, you know, that's the big city. It was about 10,000 people nearby. But, um, you know, the one thing I had going for me was I was lucky to have a Commodore 64. I learned basic assembler and I had Saskatchewan cold winters. Um, I really early on was lucky to get involved with bulletin boards and online community. And I think that's, you know, and I learned so many things through reading docs, books, reading, uh, you know, different message board uh, things on how to program. And so my start really, truly came back there with cold Saskatchewan, Canada winters. I moved to the United States in 97. Um, honestly, I came in as an immigrant. I was on the NAFTA visa. I came on as a temp. I was actually a vendor at Microsoft, um, answering the phones and uh, in the developer support team. I ultimately became a full-time employee and spent a couple of years in developer support. I moved um, on into product teams, uh, working on Visual Studio. Uh, the very first version of .NET Framework was something I worked on. Very proud of that. 
Um, you know, and I'd, we ju were just about to ship .NET and Visual Studio. And that was really when I made the move officially at Microsoft out of a product team. I'd moved from support to a product team, spent a few years there, Visual Studio, owning Start Page, Help Systems, and I'd moved to really work into the evangelism group. That's where me and a few people created a little thing called Channel 9. And if you're familiar with our Microsoft community, Channel 9 was really you know, a year before YouTube, a year before Twitter, uh, we created a way to do videos of our employees uh, and ship them publicly with comments and so forth. And so to fast forward a bit through Channel 9, online outreach, I worked on Build, all sorts of aspects of the Microsoft, um, you know, developer relations programs, Channel 9, leading evangelism teams, and working across, you know, events and so forth. And really, you know, getting to work really closely on products and really connecting with developers in a meaningful way is where I built my career. I um, you know, got to work on a lot of really interesting things from Windows Phone developer products to you know, areas of Visual Studio, Shipping.net. About 10 years ago, um, I helped launch Azure. And I, I think about the moment when we launched Azure, but what my responsibility was, and I'll kind of leave at this point of in the story was, you know, Let's go get someone who's open source, someone that cares deeply about developers and someone that might surprise people for, you know, that would be Azure, you know, and people thought of us definitely then as the .NET Windows Cloud. In fact, we called it Windows Azure. I got Matt Mullenweg. Matt Mullenweg, CEO of WordPress, founder of the Open Source Project. But, you know, back at the time, I asked Matt, would he come on stage and deploy WordPress? And, you know, and he was doing things like deploying Tomcat, Apache back then on Azure. And that was the very first demo. In fact, they called it about a hell freezing us over moment, right? Ray Alice brought him on. And I think about that, right? That was... You know, a thing that I had to work with Matt and get him to understand Azure and believe we had to do certain things that we'd learn. How would their platform work great on Azure? And, you know, that was a very defining moment to me that I don't realize how much it was because we look at Azure today, right? Linux, Node, of course, .NET, of course, Windows, right? Kubernetes, you know, the, the platform that we're building. And at that point, I was helping get Matt on stage. People talked about a health freezes moment over. I actually just went and watched it. And that was the beginning of Azure. So I'll leave there. That was 10 years ago. And I don't want to make this all book about that. But, you know, that was really a great big part in the story. I left Microsoft for a couple of years in there, went to work at Twitter. But, you know, all of my career, wherever I've been, has been about helping developers in one way. Did that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes perfect sense. And it was a, it was a great journey. And thank you for sharing it with us. Uh, was there a, a habit that you picked up during your... Uh early years, even if, uh, at the farm mm. you know, part of your life that you still carry to, to work life today? Oh, I, I, I got to believe curiosity, right? And I'd say the first thing you want to know, like, I'd say if you run into someone who's in like classic computing, like we're so sentimental about it, right? Like you, you get run into a Commodore 64 person and, you know, we remember memory addresses back at the time. But I really think there's something there about the curiosity that was enabled back then through how you learned, right? Um, back then I was in a town, the only other computer in the town of 100 people that I lived in was at the place that I absolutely despised most, school. Right? It was a small town school that we'd moved into and, and into that town, my parents had relocated and um, I didn't care for school so much. The only other place I was lucky, I eventually got a computer at home. And what I learned through how you program basic, I don't know if you, uh, Commodore 64 had immediate mode, right? You could write with line numbers and it would be interpreted, right? When you run the program, but immediate mode, you just type things, right? You know, print your name, probably maybe you'd walk into a store and print, type print something that I shouldn't say here, you know, and just, you know, show that on the screen. But that immediate mode and that instant kind of return and the way that it gave you results and feedback, I think um, helped me be very curious. I think being someone that had moved as a child and moved to a different city and different environment, I think that helped me also to be you know, good when things change. But all through of that, of what I've kept through from those early days is the power of community and the power when you can have community and learning, right? For me, I learned how to code in basic, then assembler, then C, 
And I learned all of that through self-study. And it was a book and you would just pour over those books. There's no, you know, there's no Google or let alone Stack Overflow, right? And it was those things, valuing of community to learn. And if I can get part of a community, I know I can go learn new things. And I think that's the big thing that I've been able to go learn. And then just finally, right? Like you think about that of what I do for a living, right? Back then I knew right away the importance of docs and how they matter for getting started. You know, learning about community and, you know, how I was able to learn from others that were selfless and sharing with me. I think those are all things that I apply to my job every day and I hope stick with me. And that desire and hunger to learn is what drives it. Yeah, I think curiosity and community are the, you know, the basic, the very basis where you, uh, especially for developer relations, it's, it's come up a lot of times on the podcast and I think it's the basis and it's actually uh, maybe even a driver, something that helps you all the way to, to where you are today. So thank you very much for uh, sharing this with us and sharing your story. Before we jump into developer relations specifics, let's talk data. This, for uh, anyone listening to this episode for the first time, under the hood of developer marketing, let's talk data section with our guest, Jeff, today. We'll pick a graph from devrelex.com slash trends. And Jeff, will you please tell us why that graph uh, is important to you, why it stands out? <laughs> I love these graphs. Well, like, well, like, okay, first of all, sort of our team mission, like if you kind of summed up a strategy, and this is internal, but if I was to explain to my team, and I think, you know, if like kind of our approach, we, we often say everything starts with great content, right? And we go where developers are, right? We connect with them as a community and we bring them back. We bring them inside to our company through docs and learn. And so, you know, the one chart just showed the importance of documentation and sample code, right? And it's so core to what we do. You know, the marketing pages on your website that I'm sure, you know, your CMO, your CEO, um, and internal you care deeply about. And those are very important. I'm not saying you don't have them. Those matter to one audience, but for developers, it's two in the morning. Innovation strikes or you hit a bug. I hope it's something you've thought of that's really cool that you want to build, right? Or a bug is you start to type error codes, right? If you're looking at a bug, you're not going to the marketing pages to do that, right? When you're going to go build something, you've probably thought about how you've wanted to implement it. It's like, okay, I want to do an IoT stack or, hey, I'm going to do this in serverless. I'm going to type Lambda because I'm an AWS person. Or like, we have to show up in those organic results. I mean, and I think you've even heard me say this before in some of the talks. It's like, you know, let's not, you have to use advertising to be able to get developers because in those paid results, the power of earned content and when a developer is searching for something to either fix their problem or, you know, or how they're going to go build something. And if we can get them to a documentation and it's five minutes to wow, like, wait, what is this thing? Is this really going to work? Oh, wait, here's a sample. Okay. Does the sample actually compile? Right. Or did they have to go down some trail for 20 minutes to go through that? But like, that's your starting, that's your happy path. That's how you are starting to connect with your developers. And so that is core and it's measurable. And then, you know, the thing that is interesting too, was like, it talked about the biggest reasons developers are contributing to open source and is to prove their coding skills. You know, you just, we as a company, right. For a long time, have that commitment to open source, right. You know, in fact, in some areas, some of the largest projects on GitHub of open source were ones that, you know, we created long before we bought GitHub and built around that. And it's incredibly important, like not only that people can like code and ideas and collective in open source, but how do you help those devs build up on their skill sets? How do we help people with experimentation? Frankly, how do we help find more developers for those other open source projects that someone has a passion around, but Maybe they don't have that, but the, all of that are on community documentation. We have found for us is really today's developer relations. It's measurable and is authentic and is aligned around a very simple thing. How do we help? Yeah. And uh, you said in the beginning that you want to help developers and uh, care about community. So it's just a perfect fit that the two graphs you picked are actually exactly that. Uh, one is about you know documentation, solving problems, and 
I think the the points you make at the developer being at 2 a.m. you know working on his big idea and getting stuck. It's the key point. We've said before uh, that documentation should be the starting point of uh, any developer program, especially if someone's building it from scratch. I love hearing you uh, point it out like this. The thing too, though, right, is that you can understand that path and then you can study it, right? Because you can kind of, you know, there's looking at the data, but then it's just yourself walking that flow. Okay, I get to one of my docs pages. How, what's the path? that I go and take somebody on here. Like, how do they go through this? So if they get to my docs, how easy it is if there's a sign-in to create an account? Is that, does that sign-in require a credit card? Um, hey, do we give them a, how much access do we get free? Hey, if I'm going to go build this a certain way, are there six choices, right? Maybe like you'll start thinking with smart defaults. Okay, wait, this is a little tricky to go do. How do I make it that the developer can quickly compile and up and running with a basic sample and they can evolve from there? Our job is to get out of the way, right? So that people can build very cool things. And you start learning and seeing things like ambiguity stalls all adoption, right? And you want to see the fastest way to like stop a developer? Have them go around, read a doc. Oh, wait, this thing solves my problem. I download some code either from a GitHub repo oh, wow, you know, I'm about ready to compile. And then we put six choices in them. Do you want to do this here? Do you want to do that? Like, give them one easy path, get them successful, and then they'll evolve from there. And so I just love that you use about docs. And, you know, I'd say over the last five years, we've kind of had a renaissance of documentation at Microsoft, in docs.microsoft.com, uh, Microsoft Learn, all of those things, you know, it's like 72 million people a month actively use our technical docs sites, right? Docs.microsoft.com. We had over 4 million people that have registered for Microsoft Learn, right? Um, and investing in that content, right? Does it matter? Yeah, 225 learning paths, thousands of modules, right? That, that we can do. We gotta go help people and go connect with them where they are. And I think, especially with the current times, free, accurate, relevant and understandable technical content can be some of the most important work that happens in our industry right now, period. Yeah, uh, you said it at period. Uh, <laughs> I literally have nothing else, you know, to, to add the, uh, on top of that. So uh, thank you very much. Everything you just said was literally uh, on point. Uh, you asked me before, uh, how can we make this podcast episode, you know, uh, resonate with people, uh, give them something they really need. I think this last sequence is exactly what I wanted to hear from you. So thank you for that. No, you're welcome. It's a topic that I love. I mean, this is my chosen profession. If I think back to 97 to today, you know, this is what I, all I've worked on. And, uh, you know, as a profession and what it means to be a developer advocate, you know, is one part of this profession. But if you look at developer relations as a business, and I hope the people that listening from this are marketers, our engineers, our program managers, technical writers, localization, right? You want to see the ultimate, the ultimate bit of empathy, right? Making sure that your documentation is in the languages, not just all the programming languages, but the languages that your developers consume. And so we have 23 different languages that we localize. For some of our products, we actually go up to about 65 locales, right? Those roles are developer relations roles. They're engineering roles too. Um, and they're essential to companies for growth and actually creating new customers and keeping the ones that matter most. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, exactly. I think you might have already said it, but uh, what do you feel is the most important trait uh, or a characteristic a devil professional should possess? Oh boy, that is a difficult question to think about. What is the most? I'll, get, I'll cheat and give a few. Number one, the ability to learn quickly. The ability to learn new things. You are at the forefront of tech of your company and you need to be at the forefront of all of your competitors and partner companies too and developer trends. So your ability to learn quickly is so key. Next, the ability to synthesize and curate. How do you take the, you know, that knowledge you've learned, you've synthesized it, 
And now you got to be able to go take that. And a great advocate, the, the third one after, you know, you go first, you know, after you've been able to synthesize it, is how do you go connect with an audience online, in person, through code, media, that there is one of well, your ability to present and connect in a meaningful way. And I'll say on our, it's about hearts and minds, right? How do you reach someone's mind? We're explaining, hey, this works and have that intellectual curiosity and honest conversation about a product, right? Everyone who builds products has bugs in it, but helping and understanding those products and understanding the customers is essential. Final thing I think is, and I'll just leave with this, is perspective. And, you know, 20 plus years at Microsoft, other companies I've worked in developer facing products. And maybe this is maybe the most important of all. You got to have that perspective. If you're working in developer relations, the, you're going to see your company's platform left to right in a totality that no one else in your company ever will because you're connected to developers that are building on it. You're an engineer yourself, and you also are actively working to help make the product better based on those things. And, and so your perspective is, is that you, you see the company left, right? You're going to see warts and all, right? You're going to see pieces of the product that are broken, and you're going to see customers some days that you're, it's not going to be able to solve that day that problem for them. And it may be a design change request that you're going to have to champion in engineering. Some of these things can take an hour. Some of these can take days. And some of these can take years, depending on where your company is. But that ability to have that perspective and go, whoa, wait, this is okay. Look at all the you know, 90% or 5% of things that our product does. And we'll get there. And believing in your product, but bringing in that feedback forward. But just maintaining perspective. Hey, wait, this is a great job that I got. This is an essential job for a company. And the job I work matters, but like not getting psyched out because you go, gosh, whoa, look at the problem I found with our product. I think that's one of the most important because it keeps you coming back to be able to teach each day. I love the role and profession. And the great news is if you've met one person in developer relations, you've met one person in developer relations. Our jobs aren't just about those. It's how we take who we are, our authenticity, us as humans, and then we convert that into that that's the creativity and that's why i love this profession so much yeah and it's definitely personal uh, as you said the, this last part if just to summarize for our listeners three is better definitely better than one uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> as a, a characteristic so i'll summarize them for you first of all you said it's ability to learn the uh, second one is the ability to synthesize and then as always perspective which is yeah i think it's really essential you need to see the whole picture Absolutely. Absolutely. So what are your tips for someone who is uh, new to the field? It's, at first, I just, again, like I think I just closed them. It's a great profession. Um, and I'm so thankful for it because the people I've met, the people I meet, the people I work with, you, you just get to connect with so many people around the world, right? Uh, you know, the fact that you and I are having this conversation, you know, I never would have thought growing up that, you know, I'd be able to connect with someone from Greece or or many of those countries. And it, it is just a phenomenal profession. You know, I think the thing to do is get connected with a community, right? Get connected with a community and start helping. If you're looking like, hey, I'm trying to land a role or I'm trying to advance in this overall field. I'd say the best thing to do is, you know, connect with a community and start to get to know the developer relations people. When I started in support, this is what I did. I knew back then we'd called it evangelism, but I knew like I was in support and I probably wanted up in this in the evangelism team. And I made some decisions career wise that I, I learned in support then I did product work and then I jumped over to developer relations. But leading up to that, you know what I did? I went back then I went to the conferences. You know, there's always DevRel people. I started hanging around with them because they're hanging around the community people. Um, you know, I'd start doing that. Now it's virtual. It actually makes it a little bit easier. You can connect, do different online meetups and get to know people. Help your own community. When I'm hiring, that's what we're usually looking for. Hey, who's a great Node person? Who's a great Kubernetes person? What are they doing out there in the community? Right? I'm not, you know, sometimes I'm not looking at follower accounts and things like that. I'm looking at people that love to connect with the community and love to do so with creativity and code and passion. And so the best thing you can do is get out there, 
care deeply for your craft and learn. And, you know, in those cases there, you'll, you, you end up landing a role because you're going to be part of a community. You're going to hear about those opportunities. Um, all I'd say is get started and welcome to the, welcome to the field and the profession. Yeah, connecting with the community, I think it's it's very key. Otherwise, how how can you help those people if you don't connect with them and try to understand them? Also, I can tell, you know, even from the first minutes of us talking, uh, that you're very passionate about being in this career path and being part of developer relations. And this really shows how much you love this. But what has been your biggest challenge? I mean, I, I think, I you know, if you look at the world of developers, you're never, you know, every day the challenges are going to be different, right? How do you connect with an audience? How do you compete for different people's time? Um, I'll, I'll bring it, this seems to be a little bit about the profession of developer relations. And I'll say I've hired quite a few people, you know, into the overall profession at Microsoft over the decades. Did so at Twitter, too, and I hired there. I think sometimes we in developer relations, I'm going to talk, pick on advocacy. And when I was a technical evangelist, I think sometimes we in this community profession, we sometimes like overthink things. Um, and we're constantly looking for like this role clarity, role definition. I see this at industry conferences. Is a developer advocate an engineer? Or is, you know, wait, they don't think I'm an engineer. And and we spend a lot of time, I think, getting caught up on, is this person a truly a developer? It's even worse when other people will pick up on developer advocates and so forth and go, well, well, they're not an engineer like me. That's often why I say, you've met one developer advocate, congratulations, you've met one developer advocate. And the variety and diversity of there are of developers, whether it's data science, no code developers, pro code developers, enterprise, mobile, gaming, node, Kubernetes, security, the level of diversity that we have. Um, you just hear so often people getting bogged down on that, on the titles and so forth for advocacy. And I just, one thing lately I've said is, for people that do advocacy work and that's so variety, we should really snap to a title as a profession, you know, developer advocate and really invest in that profession. And so my, my challenges have never been ever once Microsoft getting it to believe that developers matter. That's in our DNA. I think the thing that I've been working to really do is making sure that people proudly in the overall kind of corpus of developer relations are proud of the profession that they're in, that they know as a developer writer or a developer advocate or somebody who does community work for, you know, programs and events, you're in developer relations and you're in a great career. And in, in, in our company, that's an engineering discipline that is telemetry and experiment driven and so forth. And I'd say my biggest challenge is making sure that we in our community are taking care of each other and really advancing the profession. And I'll leave with, you know, you may have heard this, people like wanting to nicely classify and organize things. That's what we as humans do. We want to put order to chaos in every way. And developer advocacy by its nature of online outreach, while much more measurable, is messy. And we got to be okay with that. And I think just like we're okay with so many different roles and definitions of software developers, in that whether they work on data, backend, client, or all the things I listed to, developer advocacy, there's probably a few things we come together, but if we're going to invest as this, as an engineering discipline and a profession, we should come together more on, some, on a few things when we talk about it, even just title. And so it just helps me to kind of go land the profession and people understand it. Did that make any sense? It was kind of long-winded, so sorry about that. But I yeah, no, no don't worry about it. It, make, it makes perfect sense. And uh, do you and see I, that though? Like you know, so often we're like, oh my gosh, is this person an engineer? Or is this a title? And I'm just like, folks, just focus on helping somebody. All this time when we're trying to hammer this out, like let's go help somebody. Um, it's so important. Yeah, it all comes down to this helping. You know, as you said, coming together. Uh, the developer relations community then to advance the profession and actually be able to to help even more developers and people. Yeah, totally. How do you build your developer relations strategy? What what the main focus of it would be? Oh, I think my, you know, our main focus is kind of with the same thing I've been going over and over here is 
how do we help developers? And it's really our, you know, it's, it's around a few things, right? How do we make sure we have a great learning and skilling environment? Microsoft Learn, microsoft.com slash learn. You should go to it. My team builds it and it's part of the overall digital skill, this massive digital skilling initiative that Brad Smith announced recently. You want to learn our cap cloud? Great. We will make it free. We want to make sure you don't need a credit card. We will make it fun and entertaining. And you can go all the way from learning Azure fundamentals by role developer, solution architect, ops admin, and many more from there. You can learn that for free. And you can even go to certified if you do that. That's a part of our strategy is that, you know, creating opportunity for those developers. The next part, when I think we think about it, right, we are not the .NET, you know, Windows cloud, right? We are the .NET Windows, where we're Go, Java, Python, Linux, right? And we really have been about our strategies about meeting developers where they are, right? We go to those node meetups, right? Now it's virtual, right? We go out to where our developers are spending their time and then we want to connect with them. And, we, and, and it's really about um, getting product feedback. Oh, you're not using this. Why not, right? Features like certain things to Azure right now where we did these uh, current storage spaces and the work for really for like more static web developers, the node developers, we're all driven a lot of that through our advocacy work to really understand how to build that scenario on the product teams. And so we are embedded in engineering and we're part of engineering. We're, just like, we're not like some random team put into that. We're part of that engineering process. And so our Strategy revolves around amazing technical content, whether it's a doc, an API reference, or a guided skilling path. It's going out to those communities and authentically connecting with developers, giving talks, and then helping people to maybe you know understand Microsoft or how a particular solution will relate to them. Sometimes it may be surprising. Mean, wow, I didn't even know you had that. And then helping them get successful, right? And you know, right now, you know, we talk about where do we go, right? Well, developers are online, so that's where we are. I got to tell you, like, you know, we had the recent build conference. It's really a great time when it doesn't feel like a great time in many places around the world, right? It doesn't feel like a great time in some of our communities. But the one place that sometimes feels good is that when we get out and are able to connect with our communities because we support. And we get um, help from one another. Super, super uh, important right now that we're making that human connection somehow, at least virtually, when we're all at home right now. This brings me actually to my next question, because uh, everyone's at home right now. You know, uh, no one has been through that whole situation uh, before. But how have you been approaching the online events like Build and Inspire? Yeah, so, we, um, we, yeah, it, it, it's been interesting. Um, you know, I'd say first, what's been interesting, first of all, my team, right? We build docs.microsoft.com. We do all the technical writing and content and APIs. We build skilling and learning. So we build these digital platforms, right? That, you know, if you look at the numbers of people that come to these, I was talking about earlier, you know, 72 million monthly active users across these, you know, our doc sites is one example. Well, since we've had that online motion, right? Or that online kind of approach, our advocacy had, had been done that way. You know, my history working on everything from Channel 9 to Build, PDC, and our different developer events. In some ways, we had been doing a number of different things already to do kind of online work. What was interesting is I think we probably could have, you know, we've simulcast Build events and so forth before. We made a decision that leading up to about eight weeks leading up to Build, that we were going to build the event from the ground up because we felt we had to create our content in a different way for that modality. And I'd say that's a big part of our developer relations approach, which is, you know, if we're doing node content, we should color code accordingly. We shouldn't color code it like VB code, for example, right? And so tailoring by those audiences has always been important with an online reach. So when so what changed it was we immediately got into planning build and we reset the event. And we said, look, the exit door is like 300 pixels away from a person that's running a video session. You know, we've always done breakout sessions, sometimes 10 or more breakout sessions running simultaneously for the online audience, right? And so with build, it was a complete redo of the event. 
And that was kind of the start, which and it really was this incredible moment for the community. You know, we were at over 200,000 registrations at the event, um, and they just kept on coming in at the tens of thousands of throughout. Um, we had over 115,000 registrants, but like we had over like 200,000 people would tune into a key segment for the event. This is an event, folks, that's like maybe had 5,000 people at it previously right? It was an event that used to be 80% um, US this year, 65% of the attendees. It was 80% US, 20% before. This year, 65% of the attendees from around the world. And so we changed the format. Our advocates, if you watch the show, were delivering breakout sessions along with the product engineering teams. We did interstitials and we completely changed up that format. I think I slept for four hours that week. Um, some of the stuff, the way we had to do stuff, there were we just didn't have people in roles because the, the way we did events, the different doing an online event. So I remember I didn't go to sleep for a couple of nights. I was doing overnight shifts on different things we were doing, but we followed the sun, went 48 hours straight. And what didn't change is that our ability to help. What didn't change was our ability to go online, but what changed is the mix up of it. We're, we're hundred percent online. Build was a major moment because as build finished, we launched Learn TV. So if you go to microsoft.com slash learn slash TV, we built a little TV channel. And, you know, you may tune in, uh, want have something specific that you want to tune into for audio and video. Um, learn TV is a way that we curate. So our developer advocates curate content. It's live. It's on demand. And we launched that as the credits rolled for build. We launched Learn TV. And so what changed was we got through build event finished up and we didn't go offline. And ever since we've been running Learn TV, uh, we continued on after that and did inspire more virtual delivery. We're actually seeing really good response from our customers on those because we're, you know, not trying to recreate everything that's bad about event, you know, long, long, long keynotes maybe are sometimes not great, um, but small segments um, have an adjustment. So we've adjusted there. We invest deeply in our digital skilling platform, something you know, another change that we did, you saw Brad, you may have saw Brad Smith did a recent kind of big skilling announcement. We're going to skill 20 and certify 25 million people to help them get jobs. That's built around Microsoft Learn. And I think now we're, we're just trying to adjust and like everybody figure out what's the best way to do this? What's the best way to go do meetings? What's the way to combat the fatigue that you might have? How do you stay connected to the community? And right now, um, developers online, the people have never needed develop relations as a dis discipline or profession, regardless of what company you're at. There's the company that I work for, Microsoft or one other. They've never needed you more than ever because you are the people that, you know, that stay and connect. You're the people, the last person to leave a meetup of sort, whether it's virtual online or in person to make sure everyone's taken accounted for. The world needs DevRel more than it ever had. And it's a great profession to be a part of. Yeah, definitely is. Definitely is needed too. I got to say, I was uh, one of the participants on uh, your build event uh, for the first time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, in, despite the, the other uh, whole uh, situation around the world, but I was very happy that and then I could really see uh, the actual value offered there. And um, I really like to learn TV. Uh, you just briefly mentioned it. Uh, why do you think it was so important to, to launch something like uh, Learn TV? Um, so, so, you know, I think a couple things, right? You watch what's happening with streaming and so forth, right? Our average viewing duration for build, 161 minutes. Now, you're a metric guy, right? You know web metrics and video metrics. Think about yeah, that yeah. for a second. Yeah, 161 yeah. minutes. And, you know, you think about the viewers of those segments, more than 200,000 live viewers of individual segments. Like, and so what I'm talking about, like, these are breakout sessions, right? Like my team, probably the largest sessions that my team has ever presented to, and they get to present to big audiences, 8,000 people. Like, so the audience had changed, streaming had changed, the way that people had consumed information, I think had changed rapidly. And how, if you look at where everybody is, one of the things that Learn TV and it's kind of a little bit of nuance is that 
um, the way it works behind the scenes. And what we do is we've kind of flipped the model. So we're out on Twitch, YouTube TV, our advocates are out where people are. Learn TV actually just goes to, this is in the weeds, goes to that endpoint, that streaming URL and aggregates from that point. So if we were streaming this podcast live and it was a video podcast, if you gave us an endpoint, we'd be able to pick up your endpoint and, and syndicate that and run that on Learn TV. It's on a, on a property that we own. And we wanted to make sure that when the event continued, that we could just continue on with the conversation. That seems like something we've been saying for 30 years. All of us have been in Devrel too long, right? Um, we wanted to make sure that we had a way to connect. But the other part of it is, you know, if you look at all the different subdomains, and probably the, the sprawl that you might get of Twitch and streaming places and so forth, and much like Twitter, you're going to have people that you're going to want to follow, but like we're a company like Microsoft. What if I just want to find out what you think is cool and I should be watching right now? You know, music. Sometimes I go to Spotify and I pick music that I want, but then other times I don't have a, I'm not really sure what I wanted to. So I go to Pandora and I'll have it mix something for me. Learn TV is a little bit like that Pandora or a little bit like something that we're going to curate for you, like a TV channel. There may not be something there for you. And it was important to really have that connection to our customers in a way that they knew that was predictable for all of the people. And then I think we start building audiences through that as well for all of our employees that stream around the company and build really created a moment where so many of our employees, even more so were learning how to stream and learning how to connect. And so it's very early for Learn TV, but we have big things planned. That uh, sounds very exciting and, you know, best of luck with it. Uh, I'm definitely going to it after we finish this interview, but could you please repeat the, how people can reach Learn TV? Sure. www.microsoft.com slash learn slash TV. Okay. Or if you just go to microsoft.com slash learn and pick TV on the, on the navigation. Okay, great. I'll definitely be visiting that the moment we, we close this interview. So how do you see developer relations evolving in the future? I think it evolves, you know, honestly, by the creative, creativity of the individuals that are part of the profession. And, you know, I sometimes think of us all as media hackers, right? We're often the first to find the way to connect with people over media. And so I don't know what changes other than as technology um, adjusts will be there. Um, you know, I think back to when I, with the earliest days when I started to be an advocate, I remember one of the times it was one of the first times that some little stunt that I did ended up at our CEO's office. And that was Bill Gates at the time. And that was because I was using Xbox Live to take software vendors. And this was, we have independent software vendors, ISVs. It was 98 people that built software for Windows. And I was meeting them on Xbox Live for meetings to play video games with them. And I would do <laughs> golfing and I would do all these other things. I do it on home in the evening. And Bill found out of it. And he's like, good title choice. At least you didn't pick Halo. I don't know if we should be fragging our vendors, but good job, Jeff. And I remember that it was kind of this fun little thread. <laughs> and, you know, Know, that was Xbox Live, and I and I my boss thought it was really great. And he goes, "Why did you do this?" And I said, "Where else can I spend three hours with a customer one on one than playing video games and getting to know them?" And that was Xbox Live, and a long time ago, and a much younger me. And so, whether it's Twitch, Twitter, you know, our own Microsoft Learn properties or our events, what's going to change is someone's going to come up with a really cool idea how to connect with someone and teach them. And they're going to do so in a way that's clever and, um, and others will build upon that and learn. And that's why I love this profession is the fact that I get to mix with media and I get to work with code and I get to have samples and video and the internet is our palette, my friend. And so whether it's this podcast or some code on GitHub, we get to hack away at that and we get to go out and connect with a community where there's no distance between our community as a customer. And so the future is more open source, more media, and more authenticity and, and, and enabling it so that more people can be part of this. And that's the future, but it's up to the people that are listening here to come up with that. Yeah, exactly. I, I kept nodding as you were saying that 
totally agree there. It's it's all about the people. It's about about the community at the end and uh, how far they do they really want to go. Definitely, uh, definitely. Over, I'll say the whole years of your experience, um, because right now with a pandemic and everything, it's just a, a small portion of it, uh, and we've t- really touched upon that. But uh, what do you feel are the best ways to connect with developers? Mm, peer to peer over a beer, um, and what I mean by that is like not literally over a beer, but I mean, you know, it's really about asking questions, right? Your, your ability is either to help or learn in your mode that you're in. Peer-to-peer over beer to me is I'm not selling to you. I'm hanging out with you. I'm a peer. I don't think I'm better than you. I don't think I'm, you know, we're peers. And we're going to have a conversation in that spirit of helping. And if we're peers, you know, you know we're going to have this conversation that I hope you listen to. And it's going to be two-way because we're going to be peers. Over beer is... We're not going to be so polished and mechanical with this. We're going to be relaxed and we're going to be open and we do. And so I always feel that it's, you know, I've always said it's peer to peer over a beer. That is our narrative and our tone that we must conduct ourselves with community. It's service driven, right? And it's not just service as a platform. You hear about servant driven leadership, right? Advocacy and reaching out to developers is that way. And then I think it's understanding, right? When, how are you going about approaching and, and really winning their heart? That's different than sometimes winning their mind. Their heart may be around, hey, look how clever this is. Look how elegant this code is. Look at this. Wait, this is the same cause and interest to me. I'm interested in NASA. I'm interested in science. I'm building around scenarios, if you like. It's really all about being relatable and, and, and connecting back to the community. I think you can get more uh, authentic that uh, peer-to-peer, beer-to-beer, a lot easier to connect with someone where you're uh, uh, relaxed or, you know, if you're playing games on Xbox Live with them. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Jeff, it's been great uh, having you on the show. Uh, I'm sure you answered a lot of questions, uh, but if people have more questions for you, how can they reach you? I'm on Twitter. I'm at Jeff Sand, J-E-F-F-S-A-N-D. Follow me on Twitter. Send me a note. And, you know, just really, thanks for everybody listening. If you're listening to this podcast, you're part of a community and profession that I'm so proud of to be a part of. Um, and thank you. Um, also, just a word from, you know, my, the company I work for, Microsoft, we are always hiring. So if you are out there looking for a developer relations role, Um, and I know the job market right now might be, you know, might be challenging for many. It sure is. Um, we have a number of roles and we're, we, we tend to be remote friendly for people that work well remotely. Um, it depends a few things on roles and position, but we're always hiring. But thank you for all that you do for the, for the community as well through this podcast and all your efforts. Thank you, man. Yeah, uh, I'll also add a couple of the listings on uh, DevRelX, which is our uh, hub full of resources when we also get uh, the graphs we were talking about earlier. We also have job openings there. So uh, Jeff, I'll make sure to also cross post them, uh, the jobs there for uh, anyone interested. Uh, Thank you very much for taking the time to do this interview with us. Uh, It's been a great honor and uh, you clearly have a lot of passion for what you do. And uh, honestly, I couldn't ask for uh, not only better season start but uh for a better interview someone who is so passionate and want to share the experience and loves the community and loves what they do so thank you very much for for joining me welcome to season three of under the hood um, <laughs> thanks man appreciate it thank you very much jeff and uh, for our listeners thank you for listening to under the hood of developer marketing now the third season of our podcast devoted to developer marketing and relations you can listen to all episodes find free resources and the latest news and include their uh, jobs at microsoft at derelex.com you can also subscribe to our bite-sized bi-weekly digest or follow us on twitter for regular updates at slash data hq thank you very much